Hello everybody, this is Steve with New Egg TV and today in the studio we actually have a very special interview planned for you. We have two awesome guests from Intel in the studio. Everybody wants you to meet Jeff. Jeff, how's it going? Good, doing good Steve, thanks. Excellent, we also have Nate. Nice, how you doing Nate? Nice to be here Steve, thanks. Good. Awesome. We also have JJ too, he's going to step in a little bit later to discuss uh, some more of the, the finer points of the exciting things we're about to unveil to you. But let's just dive right into it guys. So if, if you guys haven't already heard, Intel has released a new SSD series, the, 700, the 750 series, right? Correct. And the, so there's two form factors that are involved here, 2.5 inch and NVMe, right? 2.5 inch and adding card, Steve. Oh, an adding card. I'm so sorry, <laughs> AIC. What am I saying? That's all right. Um, but what's exciting about that is obviously it does utilize NVMe, That's which, right. is, which is awesome. Um, so maybe we should talk a little bit more about what NVMe actually is because my understanding is probably potholed a little bit, and I'd love for you to just fill it in for me and the viewers as well. Sure, absolutely. So uh, introducing a PCI Express storage solution like an SSD, uh, there's been a few things that have come out in the market uh, uh, as over the last year or so, mostly based on an HCI protocol that was developed a long time ago for spinning media. It's been around a long time, so it's got a command set that carries around a lot of legacy baggage and things like that. Mm -hmm. NVMe, non-volatile memory express, as it sounds, is a protocol and a command set that was developed from the ground up specifically for storage solutions based on non-volatile memory storage. So uh, it sheds a lot of that legacy baggage. It streamlines things in terms of the command set, and so it, thereby reducing latency, mm -hmm. but also increasing parallelism. So you get the benefits from those multi-core CPUs that you have or you may be using in your workstation or your desktop systems for gaming, applications, ANSYS, whatever it may be, and that parallelism really extracts the value of multiple cores from the CPU. Absolutely. Um, so I know one of the other benefits too is that you're going to have direct access to the PCIe Gen lanes, right? And specifically Gen Gen 4 in this particular. Gen 3. Gen 3. Gen, what am I saying Gen 4 for? Yes, Gen okay. 3, because I want it to be Gen 4. Yeah. We're not quite here yet. <laughs> uh, but no, but it's four lanes. That's four right. Four lanes at Gen 3. So why then? go to like 2.5 inch form factor. And, I mean, obviously there's gonna be some limitations here, although I know there's a, there's a that was a trick question, but, but why do that? No, it's a, that's a really good question. What we wanted to do, the customers are looking for something that's unconstrained performance, right? To deliver that level of performance, we need something that can both deliver the power needed to drive that performance, right? We need something that's in a package large enough to actually put down the media so we can deliver things like 1.2 terabyte in this case, right? Mm -hmm. Customers that are looking for this kind of performance aren't looking for tiny drives. They're looking for big drives, right? They're mm -hmm. premium products, high-end enthusiast platforms. Delivering an add-in card is something that is pretty easy to do where we can slot, put this right into a PCI Express slot. But in a lot of cases, you may not have an accessible PCIe 3.0 slot. It may Fair be enough. consumed with graphics cards. Sure. Uh, it may be a motherboard with only one slot. You know, several things can happen. Or you could just be in a very small form factor system where there's just no room for an adding card. The two and a half inch solves a lot of those problems. So Nate, I'm going to turn to you a little bit on the specs. Can you fill in some gaps for us? Sure. We've actually got the two form factors here and they're actually both the same performance. It's interesting to note wow. the two and a half inch drive is the same performance as the add-in card. Um, the, the actual specs range uh, on, on the lower capacity drives from around 900 megabyte writes to 2200 megabytes per second reads uh, up to you know, 1200 megabyte writes and 2400 megabyte reads, right? Um, so pretty, pretty killer performance. And, yeah. uh, and <laughs> that, was our, that was our specification, right? You'll, I think we've had some, uh, some success with the firmware in later, uh, later iterations of the drive where we're actually able to exceed those a little bit, which is pretty cool. Um, on the random side of the uh, random side of the house, you know the uh, the IOPS uh, on the 400 ranged from 230 uh, 230,000 IOPS uh, on the 400 gig uh, up to 430,000 IOPS on the uh, or I'm sorry 430,000 IOPS on the reads on the 400 gig, um, and then the 1.2 is uh, 290,000 write and 440,000 read. So I mean these numbers, especially reads, are possible with RAID setups with other SSDs. Like why why choose this? I mean I, I already kind of know, but I'm going to ask the same question that I've been reading all over on the internet. So why why not a RAID solution versus something like this? Yeah, I mean and RAIDs RAIDs have done quite well over the years for people that need that uh, that top tier performance, right? Um, 
one of the biggest bottlenecks for RAID is the, is the connection between the, the platform controller hub, the, the PCH, up to the CPU. Mm -hmm. um, on the current generations of chipsets, that, uh, that pipe is relatively narrow, right? So even though you may have four drives that are each capable of 500 megabytes or 550 megabytes a second, mm -hmm. uh, that DMI bus is going to limit you, right? You, you'll never be able to squeeze more than about 1,500 megabytes per second through that pipe. Mm -hmm. So you can keep adding drives all you want, but you'll never <laughs> actually use them for anything. Completely yeah. saturating it, right? Exactly. So comparatively, uh, I mean, I'm assuming then the cost of a, a RAID setup with four different drives to try and saturate the same 2400 or 2500 uh, megabyte per second speeds that you get with something like this, obviously going to cost a lot more than this drive, I'm assuming, right? You're, you're going to have to buy four drives and you're going to have to buy a RAID card and those RAID cards are not exactly cost effective, yes. <laughs> Mega RAID. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, well, let's let's actually defer to JT for something really quickly, if you guys don't mind. Let's, Absolutely. Let's grab him, and I'll ask him a couple more questions, too. Okay. Fantastic. All right, so JJ, thank you so much for, for stepping into the middle of our video to talk about the awesome new connector that you've worked with Intel to actually implement. Right? Yeah, definitely. I was okay. glad to be here. <laughs> and the 8639 connector is the actual name that we're going with right now until maybe there's a standard that's produced or something else to, to actually signify it being a, spe a special name. But for right now, we're using 8639. Is that, is that the case? That's the, that's the name of the connector, yes. Okay, and, and you're, you're utilizing this on the 2.5 inch drive. So why don't you go ahead and, and tell the audience a little bit more about why the choice to use this actually came into consideration and, and a little bit more about the development of it. Okay, yeah, so I mean, the, the 8639 connector, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but it, uh, it looks very similar to a standard SATA connector. And uh, the difference that you'll see here is this key that kind of bridges the gap between the normal uh, SATA signals and then the power. Mm -hmm. uh, that key kind of indicates that what you've got here is a, an 8639 drive. And uh, the reason actually we use this connector is because it provides the full, uh, the full performance that we require. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, so this drive delivers the same full performance as the add-in card here. And we need a connector that's basically capable of delivering that, you know, kind of that raw, that raw throughput, right? Um, do you want to talk about the yeah. connector too? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the connector, you know, s matches up with the drive on the other end. Uh, out here, we've got a SATA power connector. Um, this this will actually cover up where normally you would see the power connector on the drive. Uh, you just plug a standard uh, SATA power connector from your power supply into this, and then on the other end here, uh, the official name for this is not very exciting. Is the SSF SFF eighty six forty three, also called the Mini SAS HD connector, uh, and uh, ASUS so was a uh, uh, able to put this on their boards, uh, th as JJ will probably uh, elaborate here in a minute for you. Yeah, so I mean, we were really excited. I mean, um, pretty much, you know, we've been in uh, discussions and in development with Intel for a very long period of time when it comes to the solution. And as you know, we're a performance-oriented company. We want to bring the absolute best products to the market possible. Yeah. And so when we have the opportunity to be able to work with them to implement a solution, to be able to access this drive and provide it the full unfettered performance, it was awesome. But the catch-22 that you have is, of course, is when you're looking at the motherboard, you've got that traditional M.2 interface, and as of course, you can see here, it's not the same. So what we had to end up doing was developing this HyperKit based module. And this little module will interface directly with the M.2 interface. And then from there, it'll give you that actual, that mini SAS connection that then will go back out to your drive. And the great thing is then that that's fully connected in through the PCI Gen 3 lanes that are provided by the CPU. So you get that full same level of performance that you would have from the add-in card. But definitely in terms of the work, it didn't stop there. There's a lot of different aspects that um, these drives bring to the table in terms of their performance, their functionality, and their feature set. And uh, equal parts on the firmware validation that didn't have to do, mm -hmm. we also had to do on our end in terms of UEFI development to make sure that all the hooks were in place to make sure that everything hand shook easily and effectively so that you can drop in either one of these solutions into the boards and you can have an awesome mobile performance from your storage array. So then I have a question for you, JJ. I know that, that in the past there's been issues with NVMe related drives actually booting. Um, I've, I've understood that you've worked with Intel to kind of make solutions for this ac across all the boards? Or? Yeah, so we're really excited that uh, first and foremost is that traditionally when you take a look at, I'd say, higher end PCIe based SSDs that have existed in the marketplace, mm -hmm. uh, just in general, they were sometimes are hit or miss. They had different levels of support, whether you were talking about legacy based support, whether they were actually UEFI native and being able to support G, uh, GOP and GPT based installations of Windows, which is where we want to be at, especially if you're running a modern operating operating system because you want those fast post times, you want those fast boot times, yeah. you want to have that best experience possible. Oh, yeah. um, so there's a lot of little things that we kind of have to make sure to code in their support and that exists on both parts. And also on Intel side, 
The great thing is that these already have all that information set into the unit. So we just have to essentially make that direct pathway accessible and allow the drive to do that work and then boot up and then be good to go. Um, and the great thing is that we've enabled that retroactively through a UEFI update. So if you're going to go with the add-in card, every single one of our Z97 boards from the Dash A all the way up to our highest end board, just like the X99 solutions, are fully uh, ready for these drives and you're good to go. Uh, of course, ideally you want to leverage them in a Gen 3 based slot because you want to be able to maximize that performance. Yeah. Not every board is always wired in that ideal configuration, so you want to make sure to reference that. Mm -hmm. And uh, same thing for the uh, 2.5 inch. Uh, all the X99 boards will support the HyperKit, but there will be some mechanical considerations in terms of the layout. As you can see right here with the Sabertooth or take our Deluxe, which uses a vertical M.2 orientation, oh, um, those will have a great configuration where you won't be impacted by the GPU. Mm -hmm. But depending on how you're going to run your GPU configuration, it might make more sense for you to consider maybe the adding card mm -hmm. uh, instead of the M.2 or, um, as was noted earlier uh, by Jeff, we'll have like the Maxima 7 Impact. That's a mini ITX board, but it has been wired for Gen 3. So in there, you're only going to put that big, awesome, fat graphics card in there. Yeah. but you'll also have support for uh, the HyperKit as well. So I love the idea of a super portable, awesome video editing rig that just can handle something like this. And, and that's, that was a perfect implementation of that, absolutely. So one other thing I wanted to bring up too, or maybe another subject we can talk about really briefly, is some of the issues or things you're going to want to take in, in consideration when purchasing one of these drives. Uh, Nate, do you want to offer some, some other things maybe others have not thought of yet? Yeah, I think uh, uh, there's there's a couple of things here, you know, because we're talking about a new technology and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of new pieces to this platform here. Um, there's some things that you're gonna have to watch out for. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things I wanna point out, as you mentioned earlier, JJ, is a great point. You know, you've got these all these different PCI Express slots and you talked about optimal configuration. Um, a lot of people may not understand this, but, the slots here are not necessarily all, all created equal, right? Some of these slots uh, will be directly attached to the processor's PCI Express lanes. Some of them will actually be attached to the platform controller hub's ex uh, PCI Express lanes. And as I mentioned earlier, because that DMI link is, is relatively narrow, mm -hmm. um, no matter how many devices you stack on top of that PC, uh, platform controller hub, uh, they're, all, they're all sharing the same bandwidth back to the CPU, right? All so, all yeah, so what you really need here, uh, because th those are capped at about a gig and a half a second, and this drive's capable of much more than that, as we discussed earlier, is what you really want is this drive to be attached directly to the processor's PCI Express lanes. Um, so you may have to go through your motherboard's booklet to look to find out, you know, is this slot attached to the, to the PCH or is it attached to the CPU and, and try to, you know, try to plug it into one of those uh, CPU direct attached slots, otherwise you may not get the full performance from the drive. Yeah, two points to that though I would definitely sure. say is that one that adds value to definitely the reason why you've got those higher end CPUs that Intel makes for the X99 platform because they're enabling so many more PCI Express lanes than what you would have on the mainstream side. Sure. Um, but even if you were to handicap it, which would not be ideal, yeah. um, NVMe and the controller that they have implemented in here is so robust and it's so high speed, the efficiency improvements, the reduction in overhead and so many other aspects of this would still be far superior to that than a traditional SSD and even a, a standard SSD RAID configuration. So um, definitely you want absolute best case scenario performance right. if you're going to make the investment in this type of drive. So you want to be able to optimally route it into a full bandwidth slot. Um, but you know, depending on your configuration, you can figure out what works best for you. So Nate, anything else you'd like to add to this particular topic? Yeah, I think the only other thing I'd like to, to mention here, you know, we talked about pitfalls. The only other thing that uh, springs to mind here is this drive is, is UEFI only, right? So you're going to need to make sure that the board itself has a UEFI BIOS and it's got to be capable of running the NVMe um, boot driver, the UEFI boot driver, right? Um, you also need a UEFI capable operating system. And in this case, you know, the win Windows 8, Windows 8.1, uh, future versions of Windows should support that. Uh, Windows 7 uh, does support it in a limited fashion with 64-bit. It's a little bit, a little bit more of a, uh, you got to play with it a little bit to kind of make it work, but uh, we'll have obviously have guides on how to do all of that on the website uh, available for you if you run into problems. Yeah, uh, and tying into that, that's also part of generally your entire component consideration chain. So everything from your storage array to the motherboard and its UEFI to even your graphics card, all those devices in the chain you would ideally want to have suited so that you make sure to have that best class experience. Excellent point, yep. guys. Thank you. All right, so, so JJ had to take off to do some more benchmarking, but <laughs> he'll, he'll be back at some point or another. Uh, but Jeff, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, benchmarking on these drives, obviously, you need to pay special attention to, and maybe some special needs for benchmarking, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a whole new world now, right? We're moving away from SATA and HCI to PCI Express, but not just PCI Express, but PCI NVMe, as I alluded to before. Mm -hmm. When we moved to NVMe, 
um, we don't just have one SQ pair, we don't just have one set of uh, command queues. We now have a, a, a number of queues that's directly proportional to the number of cores I have in my CPU. Mm -hmm. To do that and to test it effectively, right, I need a benchmark that can actually deploy multiple workers. Not all benchmarks are equal in this space, right? This is, like I said, it's a whole new world out there. So you got to start using benchmarks that are really capable of testing an NVMe storage solution. Uh, today we recommend Iometer, um, and we're also working with the author of Crystal Dismark to help him understand how multiple workers work, and he can he's 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 going to be launching a new benchmark there. And Nathan can talk more about that as well. Please, Nate. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean. Like you said, you know, the benchmarking an NVMe drive uh, is fairly challenging. It's a it, it's a it's a kind of a new paradigm, right? Uh, there's, you know, you've got a lot of different workers now, and the number of workers are you know correspond directly to the number of cores in your CPU, and they're all feeding different queues. So it's important uh -huh. that the benchmark is updated to kind of to know that those things are there and to, to use them properly, right? Um, you know, right now the, the iometer tool uh, is available for free for download. Um, it, it can be challenging to set up correctly. Um, we're going to have a document available on the website that will kind of walk people through it step by step. Wow. Um, and you know, it basically how to get the, if you see these numbers on the data sheet, here's how you do it with iometer, right? Gotcha. Um, and it will give you every kind of data, every piece of data you ever wanted to know about this drive. Um, <laughs> on, the, on the easier side of things, right, the Crystal Dismark I think has been out there for quite a while. People are familiar with it, they understand it. Um, and the author was kind enough to kind of uh, work with us to, you know, as we explain to him the nature of the problem, to go off and create this version that kind of understands these multiple cues and uses them uh, correctly. Uh, and he's got a, a beta of that out on the web right now and I think he's going to be going to production with it uh, probably early this summer. Wow. So. Uh, can I ask you a quick question too, something we didn't cover yet. Uh, how many different channels does the controller actually have access to to the NVMe? Uh, there are 18 channels on the drive. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, well, that sort of begs the question for me on, on uh, more benchmarks and performance. Uh, I'm assuming we have some benchmarks that we can show the audience a little bit about it and talk a little bit more about performance while they're viewing that. Um, okay. Does Sounds great. Want to jump Absolutely. In? Okay. No, that's perfect. Yeah. We've got Crystal Dismark running here on the system, and we can actually demonstrate that as well as a, a demo of uh, Adobe that we've put together for you guys as well. Do you have comparatives too with other drives or, or just? Absolutely, yeah. We can actually show you the usage model of using the software itself running a SATA based drive compared to the PCI Express NVMe drive. So you can actually see the difference, not just in scores of synthetic benchmarks, but you can really see a real world usage model difference where this benefits the user as well. So, so Jeff, Nate, going back to, to cores and actually affecting the performance of this drive, if you're going from a four core processor to an eight core processor, and, and, and by the way, does hyperthreading in, involve any additional performance or is it just hard? Cores. No, sure. It's, it's hyper-threading as well. So okay. the number of cores, physical cores, wow. logical cores, whatever it may be, you're going to see increased performance with many cores and NVMe storage solutions. As we talked about, cores and queues, right? How do I marry these two together? Wow. Uh, now we've opened up a whole new world. This is a whole new world for developers. It's guys that are doing uh, workstation applications like finite element analysis, computational fluid dynamics. Um, CAD, uh, you pick it, simulations, guys that are developing games using Maya and pushing along huge textures and things like that. Now that I can, and by the way, a lot of these guys are running multiple things at one time. Again, we talk about hyper-threading and running multiple things. Well, this is where NVMe really shines, right? Now, it, it, as, as the platform scales, not only are we scaling the CPU, but we're scaling storage, so now it's a more balanced platform. I've unleashed the storage solution to now put the onus back on the CPU and therefore I've given you more CPU performance as well. You know, the whole platform uh, performance rises. It's, it's not just about storage. Wow. So do you mind if we jump into a demo real quick? Sure. Yeah. Okay. That'd be fantastic. Sounds good. All right. So this is the demo section. JJ, why don't you start off by telling us what's in the test bed? Sure, we've got an awesome XN99 based system. It's powered by the uh, Sabertooth X99. We've got a 5960X. We have 32 gigabytes of Corsair Dominator DDR4. I've uh, got a GTX 980 Strix graphics card. Of course, have the 750, uh, P 750 SSD from Intel there. And uh, that's the adding card version that we're going to be running the demo off of and uh, powering it in terms of power supply, AX760. Altogether, just a representative of a high performance X99 system that's really targeted towards this type of usage. So the first thing we're going to do here is run Crystal Disk Mark, just verify that the drive is performing at its potential. Um, I want to actually note here on the uh, 4K random test, you'll see here that we have a T8. That means there are eight threads uh, generating data for the drive. Uh, the default behavior, at least as of this beta, was to have one thread here 
Uh, the problem with that then is the CPU actually cannot keep up with the drive and, then, and the actual uh, value here will be considerably too low. <laughs> okay, so one of the things we do when we normally benchmark is uh, we set an eight gig span, that's our normal process. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna leave things more or less alone and uh, I'll kick this off. <laughs> wow, Nate, those, those numbers are so much more impressive seeing them coming straight from a benchmark I'm familiar with uh, than just hearing it in a spec in a conversation. Uh, and on top of that, I should mention that we're also recording using, uh, or screen capping right now using uh, Shadowplay. So there's a little bit of an overhead for that, writing to the exact same drive, and on top of that, the operating system is also running off of it too. But please, uh, help us interpret these numbers. Sure, yeah, I mean, like I said before, uh, you know, we originally had spec these numbers uh, on the reads at about 20, uh, 2400. In this case, on the 1.2 terabyte drive, we're seeing actually 2700. So you know, we've, we've surpassed the spec uh, handily in this case, uh, thanks to some clever firmware optimizations. Um, the other thing you note here too, so the, for the 4K random, uh, the typical uh, Crystal Disk Mark display is megabytes per second. Uh, well, if we want to come over here to the, uh, the output, we can see where the actual IOPS have landed. Uh, we originally had spec 450,000. In this case, we're actually showing close to 472,000, which is pretty cool. That is incredibly cool. <laughs> That's amazing. So I know that it's also set up for QDEP32. Uh, how is that different for this drive? I mean, is that actually truly hitting 32? or? In the case of this, uh, the benchmark here, yeah, the, the, uh, the benchmark engine is able to actually uh, set up 32 queues and basically just dump, saturate them with data, wow. which is cool. Wow. Awesome. So maybe we should jump into another benchmark, too. Okay, so what I'm sharing with you guys today is a, a Adobe SpeedGrade. It's part of Adobe Creative Studio 6. And this is an application for doing color and lighting correction of videos that you shot that could be even 4K UHD videos. When I go ahead and kick this video playback back, we're actually reading files from the drive. And as you can see, once I burn through the actual cache and the frame buffer here on the graphics card, my frame rate up here in the left-hand corner is down to 17, 19 frames a second. Also, when I look at what's actually being pulled from the storage solution, you can see why. My read speed down here is capped at the <laughs> maximum you're ever going to see from a SATA drive, which is usually hovering around 550 megabytes a second. Right. Again, that's all SATA can really deliver today, right? No matter what kind of SATA drive you put down there, this is where you're going to be using an application like this where you're reading lots of data over and over again. However, let me go ahead and stop this. If I go over to the same application running a 750 series, and when I kick this off, you'll notice that I actually have two frames going. The reason for this is because that's what I'm doing, color and lighting correction. I'm trying to match two frames. This is really how the application is meant to be used. It'll, if you look in the upper left now, I'm actually pulling 24 frames a second from this drive with two of these things. It's which, pinned. Yeah, it's, it's, it's doing a really good job of keeping up with exactly the workflow. Now if I look at the actual read speed, what I'm seeing at is about 1.6 gigabytes a second. This is crazy, right? I, there's no way I could come anywhere close to this with a SATA base drive. But I can go even further than this. Let me actually go ahead and grab another frame. Oops. And we'll actually do three and see where that puts us. <laughs> so here I'm sure I'll drop below 24 frames a second because this is a lot of data now, right? Although I'm hovering right around 24, 23 frames a second. But if we look at the data we're pulling now, now I'm over 2.4 gigabytes a second in some cases, or up to 2.4 in this case with the read speed as you see here. <laughs> um, this again is pretty remarkable and I think we're going to enable a lot of software developers. We're going to enable a lot of guys that are doing video creation. A lot of guys out there shooting 4K video with GoPros nowadays since the Hero Black launched and uh, right. using applications like this, it's going to be a really great usage model for 750. Wow, Jeff, you're absolutely right. I, I'm, I'm blown away by this. Uh, I really can't wait to see what else you guys are going to come up with next. All right, so we brought JJ back. Thank you so much, JJ, for waiting 30 seconds for us to finish some other stuff up. But I actually thank all of you gentlemen for coming in. This has been really educational for me and hopefully for everybody out there. I just want to thank you guys once again for coming in. Seriously. As always, Our great pleasure. to be here. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Right on, guys. Well, uh, is there any other points or concluding uh, thoughts you want to give the audience before we part ways? You know, I want to say we really like working with ASUS on this stuff. These guys are a leader in the industry. I mean, come on, it's ASUS, right? <laughs> we're excited to work with ASUS, we're excited to work with Newegg, and we're excited to bring something to the enthusiast market they've been asking for for a long time. We've got quotes coming from customers that are really good customers, and I won't share them here, but we'll probably share them in our marketing material somewhere along the lines. But what we're hearing is that, look, people have been looking for a PCI Express-based NVMe storage solution for a long time. People were waiting all year last year for something like this, and nobody could bring it to market. The fact that we were able to pair it together with ASUS bring together two form factors that deliver unconstrained performance 
for these customers that are looking for that is a big deal to me, and that's why I, that's why I do this job. Yeah, and I definitely, I definitely mirror that statement. It's been fantastic working with Intel, and I think even more importantly is that on top of that, I think really only a combination of ASUS and Intel has been able to create this experience of a seamless level of performance, mm -hmm. uh, the interoperability and the compatibility pieces. Because at the same time, nice. this is going to be a big investment that people have already made into the platform as well as into these storage devices. So being able to go ahead and drop these solutions in, have them be fully bootable, have them work, and have to offer this level of performance, but not have to worry about any teething issues. That's a great experience to know, especially when this is something that has been waiting on. Traditionally, mm -hmm. when you get into this type of product space, you're usually going to have to wait on a lot of little things to work out. There might be kinks in the chain. So we've worked really, really hard at trying to make sure that the ex uh, experience is really as seamless and as smooth as possible. And it's been awesome to do with such a high-performing product. That's a great point. Yeah, I think you know one of our goals when we started to do this was you know we know given the past history of NVMe um, or, or even just PCI Express drives. Uh, you plug and play was key, right? Yep. And we couldn't have done that without you guys, so we appreciate it. Cool. Awesome. It's a love fest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, once again, thank you guys for, for joining us, and thank you guys for watching the video. If you like videos just like these, check out Newegg's YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com forward slash Newegg. And until the next one, we'll see you guys soon.